now have a cyborg anthropologist. I can't even say it, I apologize. Um, <laughs> Amber Case is uh, the founder of and CEO of GeoLoki, and uh, she just sold her company to Esri Center in Portland. Amber? Hello, everyone. I'm a bit jet lagged and a bit sick, so I apologize if I suddenly fall over in the middle of speech. But on the other hand, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm currently the director of the Esri R&D Center in Portland. Esri is a global mapping company that is doing some of the most cutting edge and interesting stuff out there. I'll be covering a little bit of that, um, but my talk will cover the future of the interface and the Internet of Things. We have a very interesting world today. There are devices that live in our pockets, and they cry, and we have to pick them up and soothe them back to sleep. Or they get hungry, and we have to plug them into the wall so that they can get enough food so that they can continue to serve us. Or is it we who serve them instead? Um, if we keep them for too long, they turn against us and make us look silly. So we can't have that anymore. So Geoloki was a company that was trying to build the next generation of location and the next generation location platform. We joined Esri because it was a very nice collaboration between our product set and their product set. But first, could all of you hold up your phones really quickly? I want to see how many there are in this room. Great, excellent. So the faster you held those up, the more you are cyborgs. And in reality, all of you are cyborgs because you're not Terminator and you're not Robocop. You don't have to have a brain implant to be a cyborg. All you need to do is have a symbiotic interaction between you as a human and a machine. So if you look at it, any time you interface with technology, you're technically a cyborg. Um, we have been cyborgs since a very early period of time, um, except the actual definition of cyborg came from a 1960 paper on space travel. And the definition is to which exogenous components have been added for the purpose of adapting to new ambient spaces. And that is a, a handful of words there. But really what it means is humans are strange. They like to attach objects to themselves in order to adapt to environments that they shouldn't be in. A person in an astronaut suit is a very good example of a cyborg. Humans aren't supposed to be in space, but yet they attach these external devices to themselves, and they become capable of adapting and extending themselves into an environment in which they could not normally survive. From early times, we've had physical extensions of the self. We've had the ability to hammer something, which is really an extension of the fist. If that hammer breaks, we can simply make a new one. If our fist broke, we wouldn't be able to make a new one. The same with a knife. But this only goes so far. For the last few thousand years, this device has looked and stayed the same size and same shape. It has, it has basically served the same function, and it looks like what it's supposed to do. However, nothing about this device looks anything as, as what it's supposed to do. Um, over time, it's gotten very, very, very small. In reality, the interface, which used to be solid buttons, has liquefied, and now any button can be on the screen. And when I was in college, I was very interested in studying what the next generation of the button was. If we go from solid to liquid, well, the next stage must be air. So what is a button in the middle of the air? And that I'll discuss later in the talk. So a traditional anthropologist technically goes out and studies other people in other countries, usually tribes, usually different places out there somewhere else. Um, and they write a research paper, and they talk to other anthropologists about it. A cyborg anthropologist looks at the actual world around them and says, how curious these people are, how strange the device is in their pockets. Now they look at screens and you know, how, how interesting these rituals are. And it's very important once you start waking up next to your phone, once you no longer notice that technology is in almost every part of your day, that you have a way to objectively step back and actually look at how it's affecting people. So I'm going to talk about a few things now. One is that these devices that we carry with us have this incredible ability to make what was formerly invisible visible. Um, my co-founder, Aaron Parecki, had been tracking his location at five-second intervals for two and a half years when I met him. And this was the map of Portland, Oregon he made out of about two or three million GPS points. You can see up here there's a, um, there's a highway in red where he's going very fast. It's color-coded by speed. 
And up in the top left corner, he's actually driving around very slowly looking for parking downtown in Portland, Oregon. So you can basically see his entire life spread out on this map over a period of time. And so when I first met him, we, we were wondering, what could you do if your phone knew where it was? What types of things could it activate? One of the first things that I ended up thinking about immediately was that, ah, this is finally the invisible button, a period of space that you can draw that when somebody goes into it, something automatically happens. Now, this is very hard to do because there's battery life concerns, there's real-time location concerns, there's privacy concerns. But if you opt in in the correct way and location empowers you, then you can do very interesting things. This is what Mark Weiser in the 1970s at Xerox Park called calm technology. The idea is that calm technology gets out of the way and lets you live your life. Um, you have an action, your action, as a button. The interface is no longer a button that you click. It's an invisible interface, and there's a trigger-based interaction. There are ambient notifications where a process occurs in the background, and you are the input, your location, your time of day, your current speed, and all these other different variables combine to give you some information where context is really important. So that's what we set out to build when we built GeoLoki, which is now Esri a next generation platform location. I watched all of this stuff be done on feature phones. I watched it be done in research laboratories. I watched it be done in the past at Xerox Park, And I was very upset why the world didn't have this as a platform yet. I felt that your phone should become this remote control for reality. And that location, instead of advertising to you, making you feel tracked, making you feel unempowered, it should actually empower you. So some uses of real-time location. We started building lots of different software and apps just to demonstrate what we could do with this platform. Um, the first one is we made location-based messages. And instead of an advertisement, you could send a location-based message to your friend. You could automatically um, send them information about, say, the bridge that they were going over or a place that you liked around town. And I made an open map of this, and everybody started sending me these location-based messages. So while I walked around Portland, I suddenly got notes from all these different people all over the world. And they didn't have to be there, and I had no idea when I was going to get them. And it was a very interesting serendipity, a completely new way of, of experiencing the world. The next thing that was built is uh, location-based home automation. Instead of having a bunch of different sensors all over the place, we used an X10 controller and IRC. And when we got home, the lights would automatically turn on because our device knew that it entered the GPS circle around the house. And when we left, the lights would automatically turn off. After a while, we set all of these other things up to it, like the music would turn on, and the robot in the house would say, hello, welcome home. You haven't been here in this amount of time. But the whole idea is that these invisible buttons were actually doing something in reality. To test the software, we didn't have enough funding to have, we didn't have any funding at this point in time. And we needed to have many different devices to test on. So we couldn't go out and buy all of them. So what we did is we made a real life game of Pac-Man, where we put little geofences all over the city streets of Portland. And we invited all of our friends to play. And they showed up with 20 or 30 different types of phones. And they played the game in real time. And we were able to test our software that way. But the most important thing is that we were outside and running around instead of sitting on a computer. We had blended into the real world reality again instead of actually looking at our computers in a room and surfing the internet. We had unleashed the data that was formerly on the web and put it into reality. So there's so much data that's stuck on the web right now. The biggest issue is that we see it on the web. We want to interact with it in real life but there's this big disconnect. So what we wanted to do is find some large data set, and we found Wikipedia articles with geolocation information, and we took that entire data set and put it into our platform. And anywhere in the world, someone could download, subscribe to the layer of Wikipedia notifications, and anywhere, they'd be able to interact and get information about the buildings around them without having to search or click or do anything, just ambiently in the background. We also made a real-time personalized weather app where it would tell you within your local very small area whether it was going to rain or snow in 10 minutes. It, it was really the difference between being able to bike home or wait another 30 minutes for the weather to clear up. And somebody made an app called Don't Eat That, which took all of the location-based, um, which took all the restaurant reviews and inspection scores of the restaurants and told people what not to eat instead of what to eat.
<clears throat> so we'll be integrating this into the Esri platform in July 2013. So all of the hundreds of thousands of customers of Esri will be able to use this in their own applications. The second thing I want to talk about is the quantified self. One of my friends, John Lipkowski, said, I've used all these new technologies for friends or dating, and I found that while I have many friends and a loving wife, at the end of it all, the person that I know the least about is myself. And he was very interested in having this kind of feedback loop where if you're making what's formerly invisible visible, suddenly you have a feedback loop where you can see something that you weren't able to before about yourself over time. So I participated in the Harvard Happiness Project, and I found out that while I was telling my friends and family that I liked my particular job, the job that I used to work at before I started Geologi, um, when I actually was there, I reported to the Harvard Happiness Project while I was at the location that I didn't actually like my job and that I was depressed. And I found these correlations over time, and I said, what if I look at this graph and I had happiness correlated with this? What if I could just edit out the unhappy parts of my life and increase happiness overall. And so I quit my job, and I started this company, which was a giant leap. But I noticed that I was happiest when working on this side project. But there are so many other things that could be correlated. The big issue is that we have different devices now in the Internet of Things to take all of this individual data, but we don't have a way to correlate it together. We have frictionless data gathering, but we don't have frictionless correlation. And if you have to be a data scientist to do it, then it's totally wrong. Because right now, we have this kind of Tower of Babel of different data types. All of these different platforms, all of these different interfaces, all of these different APIs, they don't speak the same language. There's no common protocol. There's no way for the devices to, to talk to each other. What we really need is an SMS for all these different types of devices, a protocol like SMS that allows basically what SMS did, phones on different carriers, on different networks, different types to, to be able to communicate with each other and interoperate. And this is really what's holding back the Internet of Things, because it's not when you have one piece of information, like your sleep, but it's when you can correlate your sleep with the time of day and where you are and your happiness. And you can understand much more meaningful information about your life without having to hire somebody to take this API and mash it into this one and this one and this one, and then try and hack into another proprietary API to put it into a language that somebody understands. So when we correlate these multiple data sets is when we get real meaning, not just pretty graphics about when you sleep, which is actually really useful. But if you had one or two more data sets that you can put into that, imagine the insights that you could get. Imagine how much more you could defragment your life, so to speak. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is the future of location, the future of maps. We have all of this data now available to us. And what we're doing with Esri in the future is allowing developers to use this data in new ways. So for, for, uh, um, for example, if you could have a map that, say your parents were coming into town and you wanted to take the safest route around town or the most scenic route, or if you had all the data about the dangerous intersections, you could avoid them if you were bicycling a bike route with least accidents, if you were taking a nice stroll through town but it was extremely cold out, and you had a map like this of all the windy places in Japan, and you were bitterly shivering around because you didn't know, you could route your own way around. Um, but more in terms of life and death, this is actually a map of stroke-related deaths um, by people who uh, were too far away from, from stroke-specialized hospitals. If you knew that you were at risk for a stroke, and you knew that it took X amount of time to get you to a hospital, on average, to save your life, then you would know whether or not to move within at least 20 minutes of that particular hospital, or hospital that had specialization in that topic. So it's really important to take these different pieces of data together and start to map them out. So in conclusion, the best technology is really this invisible, ambient technology that's there when you need it, and not when you don't and it should really just get out of the way and help you live your life and be in a language that you don't have to translate into all the time in order to make these meaningful points of data come out. So no longer this. This is Steve Mann with 80 pounds of compu computer equipment on at, uh, at MIT in the 1980s. Um, he, uh, he was one of the colleagues of Thad Starner, who's working on the Google Glass project, um, and now it's very lightweight. Um, 
But now this, this is a bunch of people playing the real-life Pac-Man game where you can't even tell that they're on computers or playing a game any, at, at all, yet they're an invisible interface and actually interacting with reality through the game. So thank you very much. Thank you, Amber. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great talk. Thank you.